I'm now going to talk about a really beautiful proof um, of Joseph Shoimoshi concerning a famous problem called the sum product problem, which roughly speaking says if you've got a collection of uh, positive integers or in fact uh, positive real numbers would do just as well. Um, we can form something called a sum set and a product set. We want to know how small they can simultaneously be. And uh, although this is still very much an open problem, there, is a, there are some beautiful results connected with it, one of which I would like to show you. So um, let me say more precisely what this problem is and say more precisely what sum sets and product sets are. Um, so supposing I've got a set Uh, which will live for me uh, um, in the positive reals, although it can just be a subset of any group, but for just for this lecture, we're going to be looking for convenience at sets of positive real numbers. Um, I'll define the sum set A plus A to be the set of all A plus B, such that A and B belong to A. And I'd like to stress here that A and B are allowed to be equal to each other. Um, and the product set is what you'd expect given that definition. It's just a set of all A, B, such that A and B belong to A. And we can define other things with any other binary operation. So for example, we can define A over A to be the set of A over B, such that A and B belong to A. All those are uh, the sum set is the one that comes up most often, I would say, that the product set does sometimes, and so does uh, the quotient set. Um, so supposing we know that A has size n, is there anything much we can say about the sizes of the sum sets and product sets and so on? Um, well, one thing we can certainly say is that, um, that the size of the sum set is at most the total number of pairs, where now I'll count two pairs as being the same if they're the same, I mean, if, if allowing for commutativity of addition, they obviously give the same answer. So I'll count AB to be the same pair as BA. Uh, so we get that that's at most N, N plus one over two. So it's a number of distinct, pairs of distinct elements and then all the diagonal ones. And so we get up to N, N plus one over two. And then the same bound applies to the, uh, product set and the uh, quotient set. I think the same band, I'm not going to think about that in real time. It's either that or, or more or less uh, n squared. Um, so now let's uh, think about things in the other direction. How small can we make the sum set? Um, well, the answer is roughly what you'd expect. It's that if you take, a, say the numbers one to n, or more generally, any arithmetic progression, um, then what is the sum set? Uh, it's just the numbers from two up to two n, so it has size two n minus one. And that's the best you can do, and it's quite easy to see that it's the best you can do, because supposing you have the elements of A arranged in increasing order, then um, we, we can get at least two n minus one distinct elements just by looking at a1 plus a1, a1 plus a2, all the way up to a1 plus a n, and then a2 plus a n, a3 plus a n, all the way up to a n plus a n, and that gives you two n minus one distinct elements. So we can solve precisely the problem of how small a sum set can be of a set of real numbers. Uh, and a product set, the same sort of proof works. Except that in the case of a product set, we're not getting an arithmetic progression, but a geometric progression if we want to uh, minimize. So here's a, supposing I took the set one, two, four, up to two to the n minus one, uh, then we get that the product set has size two n minus one. So the, the um, sum product problem, which I believe was first asked by 
Erdos and Samaredi. is the following question. Is it true that for all C greater than zero, there exists an N naught such that for all N greater than or equal to N naught, so that lot there is just a, a way of saying for all sufficiently large N, we get that um, either the sum set or the product set has size at least n to the two minus c. So I notice that this is quadratic in n, so n to the two minus c is saying we get a power that's almost as big as the absolute biggest possible power that we could get. So one or other of the sum set and the product set must be almost as large as possible. That's what this would be saying if it were true. And it, there's some plausibility to this conjecture because if A is an arithmetic progression, one can show that it has a very, very large product set. And if A is a geometric progression, one can show that it has a very large sum set. So um, we certainly can't find a counterexample to this by making one of these two things very small. If there were to be a counterexample, it would have to be some kind of intermediate thing where the sum set was somewhat smaller than it is in the worst case, and the product set was somewhat smaller. But for the moment, if you want to say, you know, what can you say about a set A if uh, its sum set is at, has size at most n to the 1.99? Basically, we don't know how to say anything at all in that situation. We certainly don't know how to say enough to restrict what goes on with its product set. Um, except that I think we can show that the product set can't be really, really close to the minimum. But uh, we certainly can't show that the product set won't be as big as this. Um, or, or must be as big as this, I mean. Um, so what I want to talk about is a, a result of Joseph Shoimoshi. I think there might be an accent there. Um, which for a long time was the best bound, which was that uh, instead of n to the 2 minus c there, we can get greater than or equal to n to the 4 thirds up to log factors. Um, and we'll see from the proof what the log factors are if we really care about them. But uh, basically we can get an exponent of 4 thirds, which is not close to 2, but it's non-trivial and the proof is very, very nice. So that's going to be the main task of this video is just to show how his proof worked. Um, before I get on to that, I need some concepts that will be useful to us. So given a set A as above, um, we're going to define, this we won't use, but I'm going to give you the definition because uh, it's nice to see. So the additive energy Oh, before I give this, actually, I have to give a, um, well, I have to give another definition. So let's say um, A is a subset of the reals, and I'll say that uh, I'll define rho A plus X to be the number of ways of writing X as a sum of two elements of A. Um, so if we can do that, X has to belong to A plus A. So row A plus X will be zero, except uh, when X belongs to A plus A. And now the additive energy is the sum of all x in a plus a of rho a plus x squared. If I just said rho a plus x, then that would just 
every single pair would contribute one to the sum and I would just get the size of A squared. But if I put a square there, then that becomes a rather non-trivial definition that uh, depends quite a lot on the additive properties of A. Um, <clears throat> so let us now make some obvious corresponding definitions. So we'll write uh, rho A times X. That's the number of uh, AB in A squared such that AB equals X and rho A divided by, this will turn out to be convenient for the proof, is the number of AB in A squared such that A divided by B equals X. And then we'll have uh, multiplicative energy is the sum over all x in a dot a of rho a times x squared. That's the one we're really interested in. But it turns out that uh, maybe I'll call this a lemma that the multiplicative energy is the same as the quotient energy, so to speak. So uh, sum x in a dot a, uh, maybe this is not so much a lemma as just an observation. So, but it's quite an important observation for the proof. So it's the sum x in a over a of rho a divided by x squared. And just to see why this is, it's a sort of one line argument is that both sides count um, the number of a, b, c, d in a to the fourth such that a, b equals c, d. Now let's just quickly justify that. <clears throat> and that's certainly true here because I'm counting, I'm, I'm taking the set of all a, b, c, d and a to the fourth such that a, b equals c, d and just partitioning it according to what a, b and c, d are both equal to. So for each x, I take all pairs that multiply to x um, and square that number. So it gives me pairs of pairs that uh, multiply to x. And so I get this quantity here. But if we now just use the fact that a, b equals c, d, if and only if a over c equals about to write something wrong, let me just erase that, is d over b. Um, then we see that uh, the right hand side is actually exactly the same quantity. And that's useful because we want to, we're going to be looking at this quantity and on, when we look at it one way it's going to be convenient to think of it this way and when we look at the other way it's going to be convenient to think of it like this. Uh, since that's, let me put that down. Um, so what I'm going to start with is a lower bound. So we're going to look at the multiplicative energy in two different ways. And the first way is a lower bound. So this is a sort of double counting argument where we, we look at the multiplicative energy in two ways. We get a lower bound and an upper bound, and that shows that the lower bound must be smaller than or equal to the upper bound. And that's going to turn out to give us exactly what we need to prove Shoimoshi's theorem. So the lower bound is achieved as follows. Um, I'm not going to state it, I'm just going to jump into the proof and out will come the answer at the end. So let's note first, I've already mentioned this, but the sum of all x in a times a of rho a times x is just the square of a. And why is that? It's because any pair of elements of a obviously contributes one to the size of this Cartesian product uh, or Cartesian product a cross a. Um, and it also contributes one to this because it will contribute one to the row a of x where x is so the pair a comma b will correspond will, will contribute one to rho a times of a b so it'll contribute one to the left hand side as well so we've certainly got that those are equal 
Um, but this thing here by the Cauchy Schwarz inequality is also, um, if I just think of that as this times one, and then I split up this according to um, into the row A times X and the one, I get that that's less than or equal to um, the sum over all X in A dot A of one squared square rooted, which is just A dot A to the half times the sum over all X in A dot A of row A times X squared to the half. So that's the square root of the multiplicative energy. So if I divide both sides by um, a dot a to the half and square, I get that the multiplicative energy is greater than or equal to the size of a to the fourth divided by the size of the product set. And that's the lower bound. Now the interesting part of the proof, actually, this is interesting just because this technique of using the, the Cauchy Schwarz inequality is a really very useful one. So it's worth just uh, thinking about this proof a little bit and uh, being aware of opportunities to use that kind of argument. But the, the, the interesting part, because it was the sort of novel part, this was a very standard technique, uh, is the upper bound. So we're going to obtain an upper bound for the multiplicative energy. So how are we going to do this? Well, um, what we're going to, to do is um, I'll just draw a little picture of this. So I'm going to partition the Cartesian product A cross A according to gradient. So this is the point zero, that's the origin. So here I've got a point, uh, say I've got a point AB, and that's going to lie on the line Y equals um, B over A X. And so it's lying on the line of gradient B over A. So I do that. Um, let the possible, so the gradients are just the elements of uh, A over A. So uh, let A over A equal, just to be convenient to have some uh, M1 up to MT, let's say, um, with M1 less than less than mt. And uh, and I want to, so for each i, let bi equal the set of uh, a, b and a squared such that b over a equals mi. So it's the, uh, <clears throat> it's the points in a cross a, cross a that lie in the, um, the line with gradient mi. Now, it's going to turn out that we would really like it in the proof if all these bi's had the same size, but there's absolutely no reason for that to be true. Um, but we're going to do something called, all right, it's done, dyadic decomposition, which is a rather useful trick for making things have the same size when they don't have the same size, if I can put it that way. Uh, what I really mean is making them have the same size um, by throwing away not too much. So let's consider the possible sizes. So each bi has size between one and the largest it can possibly be is the size of A. Um, 
So we can partition. A over A into at most uh, log two of the size of A, and I better put a ceiling just to be absolutely on the safe side, sets such that uh, if BI and BJ are in the same set, then uh, bi has size at least a half times the size of bj. In other words, all the sets, uh, all the bi's that belong to the same set. Uh, actually, what I really mean is here that if mi and mj lie in the same set, uh, let me write that actually because that's just a bit more correct. If mi and mj are in the same set, then the corresponding sets bi and bj have this relationship that their, their sizes are within a factor two of each other. Um, now, we also know that uh, the multiplicative energy, which is the same as some, which is the same as a sort of dividing by energy, by the lemma that we proved earlier, that's just the same as the sum of all i bi squared. So since we've partitioned the um, mi's into at most log to the base 2a sets, um, so I'm going to rename the bi's so we can find, so by averaging, we can find um, at least, or well, we can find uh, a collection of the BIs, which we shall rename just for convenience as B1 up to BS. So it's not necessarily the first S of them, but uh, I'll just call them B1 up to BS now. Um, such that uh, the sum over all I equals one to S of BI squared is greater than or equal to one over log to base two A of the multiplicative energy, which we're thinking of in this way. So we're taking this entire sum here. We're arguing that we've split it up into at most log A bits, roughly speaking. And so um, one of those bits must have size at least this divided by log A. That's basically what I've just done. But now we've got this extra bit of information, which is all the BIs here have roughly the same size. They have the same size to it on factor two. So let's redraw our diagram and I have to do a little bit of reasoning. I'll put it over here, leave myself a little room to the left of it. I'll try and make the diagram a bit bigger. Right, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So that's B1, B2, B3, up to BS. Now, I want to get um, an upper bound for this quantity here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at B1 plus B2. What can we say about B1 plus B2? Well, B1 consists of some points that lie on this line, and B2 consists of some points that lie on this line. So one thing we can say is that, uh, well, if I take a, uh, these two directions are linearly independent. So all the sums I get from a point here and a point here are distinct. So the size of B1 plus B2 is equal to 
from the size of B1 times the size of B2. And because they've all got roughly the same size, this is where it comes in. That's at least the size of B1 squared over two. There's something else we know about the sum set B1 plus B2, which is it lies in this um, segment here. I'll just, B1 plus B2 lies in here. And a third thing we know is that uh, B1 plus B2, this is a sort of seems like a trivial remark, is contained in, well, B1 is contained in the Cartesian product A cross A, and so is B2. So B1 plus B2 is contained in the sum set of the Cartesian product. Notice this is Cartesian product, it's nothing to do with the product set here. Um, so if it's contained in this, what, what, what can we say about this uh, sum set? That actually, if you think about it for half a second, is the same thing as the Cartesian product of the sum set with itself. Because if I take an element of an A, uh, sort of a pair of things in A and add it to another pair of things in A, I'll get a new pair where the first one's in the sum set and the second one's in the sum set, which is just this and then conversely we can take something like a, a pair of elements of the sum set and convert it into a sum of two pairs. There's no trouble at all. So we have that. Now, of course, this was nothing special about one and two. I could have said the same about B2 and B3. So in general, I get that um, all these sets are contained in A plus A cross A plus A. And this one has size at least the size of B1 squared over two. This has the size at least the size of B2 squared over two and so on and so forth. Um, and that gets us all the way up to B S minus one squared, but it doesn't quite give us B S squared. So we're gonna do something else here. We just, there's another little trick. So I just draw in the points of B S. And I'm gonna define a new point, a new set, which I'm gonna call B S plus one. I'll just draw it in. I take a vertical line through the leftmost point of BS, and then I just mark in, I'll, perhaps I'll put them as crosses because they're not actually points of A cross A necessarily. And we don't, oh, sorry, they are points of A cross A actually because, sorry, but I'll put them as crosses because they're sort of new points that I've added to the picture. Sorry, it is important that they are points in A cross A. So why are they, let me just justify that. It's because A cross A is a Cartesian product. so if it contains this point and it contains a point in this uh, horizontal line then it must contain all points in this vertical line and this horizontal line I must contain this point here so if you've got a Cartesian product that contains that point and that point it must contain that point okay so we'll call the set of points that I've marked in including the bottom point that was there in the first place I'll call that bs plus one so we get the bs plus bs plus one is also contained in A cross A plus A cross A, and it has size, in fact, exactly the size of BS, all squared. But uh, be that as it may, using um, uh, this extra set BS plus one, we get that um, the sum of BI from I equals one to S squared over two, is less than or equal to the size of um, a plus a cross a plus a which is just the size of a plus a squared and let me just take this a half over the other side because it'll be slightly more convenient let's just have a look at what we had we had that this thing here this multiplicative energy was at most that times the log uh, and that is at most two times the size of a plus a squared. So putting that all together, we get our upper bound. And the upper bound is um, twice a plus a squared times log to the base two a. Uh, let's go back to what the lower bound was. The lower bound was uh, the size of a to the fourth divided by the size of the product set 
And so now we're finally done. Let me just, that gives us a twice, uh, sorry, that just, I'll leave the two on the other side. So a plus a squared times a times a size of is greater than or equal to the size of a to the fourth uh, divided by two log two a. Now we can see where the four thirds comes in. Uh, so it implies that the maximum of a plus a and a dot a, at least one of those two has to be at least as big as the cube root of all this lot. And so that's size of a to the four thirds divided by two to the one third log two a to the one third. So that's the log factor that I was talking about earlier. But the thing that was really interesting here is this factor four thirds. Uh, I'll just finish by saying that this, nobody managed to beat this for quite a long time. There's somehow a sort of natural barrier for this proof, but it has now finally been beaten. And there have been a few sort of successive improvements, but only by a very tiny amount. So the best known band at the moment is something like, I can't remember if I've got this exactly right, but something like four thirds plus one over one, one, six, seven. So a tiny bit bigger than four thirds. And it would be very, very interesting to get it would be particularly interesting to solve the problem in, in, uh, in its entirety, but even to get a sort of really nice, to get a three quarters, something like that would be, would be very, very interesting. Uh, I think that's all I have to say about this uh, proof. So I shall stop.